Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. Before we get started, a little forewarning that in today's episode, there are some F-bombs dropped because I am interviewing my good friend, Elle Russ, on her new book, Confident as F-U Asteric K. So thanks to the title, it's a little unavoidable, the F word in this conversation. Uh, so I just wanted to let everybody know that in case you're uncomfortable with it. For those of you that don't know Al, while well, this is the fourth time she's going to be on the show, so you can go back and listen to our other conversations. She's a great friend of mine. Her and I co-hosted the Women's Empowerment Summit together. She's best-selling book of the Paleothyroid Solution. She's the host of the Primal Blueprint podcast. And she's just a fantastic person all around. And I just love her dearly. And I love her new book. I feel like everybody's got to go out and get a copy of this because there is something in it for everybody. So uh, without further ado, here's my friend, El Russ. Hello, my friend. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me back on. Um, so you know, you're breaking records here on the other side of Weight Loss Podcast, Al. You are the only person in the history of my podcast that has now been on four times. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm honored. I know. I love it too, because it's always one of the most downloaded episodes that I'll get is when you and I are on together. Because we've had some that I've had ones that were on our Women's Empowerment Summit that I've aired on this podcast. And, oh, right. and then having you on for the Advanced Thyroid Series, which everybody needs to listen to, as well as for just thyroid as well. So you guys can go back and listen to those episodes. So my friends, love your new book. For those of you that aren't on the YouTube channel, you can go on and check it out. El Russ just wrote a book called Confident as F U Asterix K. <laughs> I love it, Al. First, why the title? I mean, I'm sure you've got some mixed reviews, so let's just talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I thought about the book a long time before I started writing it, and I knew what the topic was going to be. And so I messed around with a thousand titles. I'm you know, sure. you text back and forth with a couple friends, you go through this stuff. And at the end of the day, um, that's the way I would express myself. Yes, it is. Yeah. It really is. And, um, you know, sorry for those out there that don't like curse words, but, you know, I'm, um, that's just how I talk. So uh, the other thing, too, is that it's really in our vernacular right now. Like, oh, look at that guy. He's hot as F, right? You know, I'm, I'm cool as F or namaste as F, right? Or yeah, something. Yeah. So I, I thought, you know, it is so in our vernacular right now. It's how I would talk. And it's so powerful. Um, in the yeah. way that I meant it to be. And that is why I use that title. But, you know, I got a little bit of kickback on my, like, you know, like my mom at first, because she doesn't understand oh. the vernacular. She's like, I don't understand. You know, my Danish stepfather was like, what? Like, you know, so there's a, there's a few of those people, but then when they kind of realized it, they, they, they liked it. So yeah. But, um, and then as far as like the cover went, I mean, it, honestly, the cover is exactly how I envisioned it. And um, once I had the title, I just didn't veer away from it. Yeah. I wanted to show that powerful as f mountain and just it's a it's a little bit phallic that's okay um yeah yeah, yeah. i love it though and if if those of you if you're listening to l and i for the first time you know it, this is l just so you all know when she told me that she wrote a book called confident as fuck i was like, of course you fucking did like <laughs> like this, this is no surprise and it has al written all over it and i was like yeah that makes total sense and in my eyes and the way i've always thought about that you know, swear words and how you could interpret this is you can choose to make it something offensive or you can choose to make it something powerful. And I really believe that you've made it powerful by the book itself. And when you read the book, you're like, yeah, I want to be confident as fuck as well. Right. So I don't know. I love it. I think good job. I, I thought the book was fantastic. Uh, it's just a no fluff self-help book if you ask me but let's first start what like define the confident for us l because i like what you say in your book when you know people a lot of the time and i really think women especially will associate confidence with possibly a big ego and you were really clear about what confidence is yeah. So, you know, some people who may not consider themselves confident think of the word confident as a very like 
overbearing, bravado, pushy, braggarty type of person or someone who's out there and they are like the most charming person at the party. And that actually, sometimes those people are falsely confident. They're confident on the outside and they're really a wreck on the inside. And so being confident as fuck is about, it's, it's all encompassing. Um, the book is not about it's, it's about everything, but it's not about, oh, this is how you get to the point where you can be like Karen and I and, you know, talk on camera comfortably. That's performance confidence. Almost anybody, even from ground zero, being shy and debilitated and not being able to talk to a human being, and I've seen that case, can get a social coach and can work their way up to performance confidence or outward confidence. I'm more actually concerned about the inner confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and now people also have said to me, they're like, well, you know, I'm really confident. Do I need this book? And I would say, yeah, you do because I needed it too. I'm one of those confident people I know, but we also have pitfalls, you know, mm -hmm. and there are things we need to learn from less confident people, even though they're coming to us for help and encouragement in the area. We have a lot to learn from them. For example, very highly confident alpha people like myself and you included. Um, and I know you had, you know, we talked with Tanya Stewart on the women's yeah. empowerment uh, project, one of my best friends. Um, alphas were often very inaccessible because we are not wanting to be vulnerable and open or show any modicum of weakness because God forbid anyone sees us as weak. It's lame. We don't look at it on upon it kindly. And so therefore we're not really accessible. People want to be us. They want to be around us. They, they might look up to us, but they kind of can't get to know us really well because we're not showing certain sides of ourselves. So we have a lot to learn from quote, less confident people, or maybe you might refer to them as beta, they have things like diplomacy, very, like, non, not as reactive as a very confident alpha. Uh, so we can learn, you know, I, I've had to learn that from Same. some less confident people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, too, they just are, are better at receiving, and they're better at uh, relinquishing a little bit of control and letting someone else take the wheel. Now, that's not to say all confident people are type A, terrible alphas who can't sit and chill. That's not it. But I am a very, you know, type A person and you want to kind of be in control and not to control others. It's just, you know, again, it's easing into being okay with someone else taking the reins and delegating to other people. So that's a lot with the confident people really need to learn that. Um, and so we need to be a little bit softer and the people that come to us need to get a little bit stronger, you know? And so what I noticed throughout my life is that most people that I attracted, or, or a lot of the people that I attracted in my life, friends, colleagues, et cetera, I was always encouraging and helping them speak up about something, whether it was declaring their worth in a job interview or to get a raise, even at you know our own company, or you know whether it's just speaking up to a friend that's crappy. It doesn't matter. So I, I, over time, I'm just like, my gosh, I mean, this is like the story of my life. And it has been for a long time. And so it was just really natural for me to get to this topic right away. And also, here's the thing, you want confidence. Why do you want it? People want you more when you're confident. I, when I used to hire people, I would hire a confident person over someone that was skilled any day of the week. Why is that? Because we know confident people are, um, well, they're self-realized, they're proactive, they're usually on time, they're on top of it. What they don't know, they'll learn. You can sort of trust them. And so oftentimes, you know, again, this is, let's get, get to con men. You know, con men are confidence men. They instill confidence, albeit a false one, in somebody to trust them and then they take their money, right? Now that's a misuse of confidence. But again, people trust people that appear confident. So it's not necessarily acting as if, there might be a little bit of that along the way until you truly get confident. But at the end of the day, people seek out your opinions because confident people are the most authentic, usually. They say what they mean, they mean what they say, and they don't care. But again, in order to get confident as F, if you're a confident person, you do have to look at some of these other things to be all encompassing or else you are just the bravado person that's out there and you can go speak to 50,000 people but then you crumble and you're insecure on the inside and we know those people you and I know a few of those types of people out there who seemingly are very confident but they're really not and then there's the people that are the quietest person at the party and they're over in the corner by themselves and people are going oh look at that guy poor guy not not poor guy that guy's the most confident effing person in the room just standing there observing the crowd comfortable with themselves that's where you want to be in life, mm -hmm. everywhere you go, every room you walk into, you're like, I got this. You don't need to prove anything. You know, and in my book, I talk about this. I had a facialist who asked me, she, um, <clears throat> again, drawing in a person, of course, I run into a facialist that needed confidence. Yeah. And so we talk about this when I get facials and she said, 
you know, I was thinking about you the other day, L, because, you know, I get so awkward and weird and insecure when I walk into a party or a restaurant or somewhere. I just, I feel like everyone's looking at me or they're going to judge me. And she said, I was thinking about you because I bet, I bet you don't, that you don't get that feeling. She goes, how do you feel when you walk into a place? And I literally said, uh, I walk in every place like I own the motherfucker. And, and, she, and, that, yeah. and, and let me backtrack on that because that sounds so cocky and awful. But this is what I mean by that. It's not that I'm going into a place and I'm looking to dominate or I'm even looking to impress people. In fact, I don't care if anyone even talks to me. It's that I'm completely comfortable in myself. I'm open to whatever's there, uh, conversation or not. And I am just comfortably observant. I mean, everybody should feel that way. It's a really liberating feeling because it yeah. is, again, you're just you in this suit walking around, the most comfortable you can feel in that. And we work a lot on that, you and I both on the physical health. Now you got to get to the mental emotional. Yeah. It, when I read that, I laughed so hard because I will never forget I, in high school, I moved high schools from grade eight to grade nine. I decided on my own, I'm going to switch high schools. I still don't, I can't even remember why I decided this. It wasn't like I was having a hard time. I didn't move, but I decided I'm going to go to a different high school. And I remember walking in to go register for the high school with my mom and being petrified. And my mom looked at me and said, just act like you own the place. Come on. <laughs> And those words have never left me. And every time I walk into a room or I'm going into a new situation or I'm going to be interviewed, so many times in my life, I've said those words inside my head, like, just act like you own the place, man. That's, that's what you, it's confident. That's confidence, isn't it? Now, I think a lot of people listening going, oh, well, easy for you ladies to say, can anybody improve their confidence level? Doesn't matter who they are. I mean, I'll tell you the most ground zero story you'll ever hear, and I talk a little bit about it in the book. Um, I, I know someone who was debilitated with shyness their entire life. They were raised by therapists. Their parents didn't know what to do with their awkward, scared, shy, fearful child, and they put it to put the kid in a psychologist's office, and um, then not only feeling rejected by the parents, like just passing the kid off, but then there became an association with paying someone to care about you mm. because of the therapy. And they were in therapy for a very long time. They didn't have their first friend until they were 35. Okay. So if you think I can't figure any scenario that's worse than this, all right. <laughs> so shy as hell, abused by a bunch of people in their grade school. I mean, talk about trauma, then moving forward, not even really having a friend till they're 35. Uh, parents pinning them against siblings, all this kind of stuff. They couldn't even talk to people. They couldn't even have a conversation. So finally, and thank God they did this, the therapist suggested hiring a social coach that would go out with them into public to like a mall and have them start a conversation with a cashier. You know, someone who you know is not gonna, because the customer's always right, like they're gonna be nice, right? Yeah. And, and it started there. So like, that's where they started. And if you met this person today, you would never know that this was their story. They are the most outgoing, confident person that I've ever met. Now, do they have moments where they are triggered by some past trauma and stuff? Sure, but they use the work that you and I do and have a daily spiritual practice and do all the audiobooks and all that stuff to get kind of beyond that and be able to talk themselves out. But for the most part, they are so high functioning. And it's, it's just really incredible. So you, you can be at ground zero and then become literally fearless. Uh, and again, it, maybe it takes hiring a social coach and you have to go very steadily. Um, you also don't have to be an outspoken person to be confident. You know, right. you don't have to be us. You don't have to be a public speaker, share your story. Uh, you might be a stay at home mom, but you know what? You're going to need confidence to deal with that biatch at the PTA meeting who's yeah, bullying yeah. you for the past <laughs> year. How are you going to speak up to Jane? You're going to need it. You know what I mean? You're also going to need it to instill it in your kids. So again, um, maybe it's to stand up to your husband. It doesn't matter what it is. You need confidence from the boardroom to the bedroom and everywhere in between. You're never going to get what you want in life unless you speak up. And that is the biggest part of confidence is just being able to speak up and go after your dreams. But in general, what confidence is, if we could just put a blanket over it, it's having the general sense or idea, and whether you need to get there or whether you already have it, that you'll prevail, that, that you're going to prevail in life, no matter what that is. I think it's and authenticity too. 100% confident people are the most authentic people. So again, why would you want to shoot for that? Because authenticity reigns supreme with supreme. everybody, mm -hmm. with everybody. And one of the things about me, I mean, I've just been a no BS person <clears throat> for a very long time, but uh, I, one of the biggest compliments I get all the time and I love it every time I get it is when let's say uh, like I complimented um, Mark Sisson once on one of his books 
and I gave a detailed compliment. And he said, you know, I really appreciate, I know, because I really appreciate that coming from you, Al, because I know you don't blow smoke. Right. Everybody should want to get to the point where people think that way about you, because you know what that means? That means you're trusted and people know you're not going to BS them. People yeah. want to work with people like that. And they also want to be, you asked me something before the show and I gave you an honest answer. If you came to me and said, hey, uh, you know, do this, does this dress make me look fat? I would actually, as your friend go. I said to Elle, yeah, do, <laughs> do I look orange, L? Because I put this stupid cover. My face was shiny because I'm hot. So I put this stupid cover up on my face. I'm like, do, do I look orange? And she's like, Yes, you do. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like a little bit. Yeah. 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 Um, now, now people, me. but people usually now again, you know, and here's the thing in my book, I also mentioned too, let's not be a moron. If I'm at your grandmother's uh, Christmas dinner and she says the N word, guess what? Probably not a time for me to teach everybody about tolerance. How about that's your conversation with your family? Yeah. Uh, the mother says, do you like my new sweater? I'm not going to go. It's really ugly on you. No, it looks great. There are times when lying is applicable. We all yeah. let's, let's use common yes. sense, right? Yeah. Um, so there's that. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, the most authentic people will prevail. Yeah. Again, yeah. they're trusted. The people yeah. want to hire you. Um, and it's again, you're healthier, I think. Like you're, you're, because if you're not authentically who you are, A, you're unhappy. You're suppressing energy in your body. You're not speaking up. Like, I mean, let's talk about the thyroid. It's all about voicing your opinion. It's, it can make you so that you're unhealthy when you're not being authentically who you are. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I talk about it in the yeah. paleothyroid solution, in my first book, how, you know, Louise Hay discovered that that was the thoroughfare yeah. of people with thyroid problems. And that was my, when I look back, when I got thyroid problems is I was in a relationship with a very moody, uh, drunky type of guy. Drunky. And I walked on eggshells around his attitude and I, 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 I was, I couldn't speak up and I felt choked up in the throat. And that's when my thyroid problems start. I didn't really until like seven years later go, what was going on then? And I looked at the scenario and I thought, oh my gosh. And here's the thing. I speak up all the time. I just couldn't overhear in a relationship. So here's the thing. If you yeah. think you're confident as F like us, that's great. But you got somewhere to Thank dig you. in and find there's something going on. And with me, you know, and, and this is where you are mentioned in my book. Um, for me, my biggest pitfall to being confident as F, because I'm already the most confident person I know, how do I get to be inner and outer fully confidence was me getting over the shame of having a hand disability that I got 20 years ago. And the reason, and I, I you know, I, this is probably one of the best chapters. It's a wonderful chapter in the book. I think it's a great story. But I, I mentioned Karen in there because for so long I was so shamed and embarrassed, again, of appearing weaker, admitting that I had to accept money from like something called disability. Nobody wants that label. Not an alpha female, too. Not a confident female. No. Not a confident female. And also, too, you know, it's something like, you can't see, right? I look normal to you. So it's way easier to hide. And so I did. But what that did is it, it, it just dug this horrible hole of shame in my life. And I was so embarrassed. I was hiding this thing. And what it did is it prevented me from having true connections with people because everybody would be vulnerable and tell me their stories about their life. And then I really wasn't reciprocating. It was a little bit of a one-sided friendship. So I couldn't get close to people. And I, I intentionally didn't because I didn't want them to find out my secret, right? And it happened in relationships relationships mostly because I was too afraid every time I met a guy and be going down that path to just sort of admit that I had this thing. Um, regardless of, it doesn't affect my life too much on a daily basis, but it is, again, it's, it's in here. And while everybody and their mother was like, this is nothing you should be ashamed of, you got injured, that doesn't help the person that's ashamed, man. That's just calling me ridiculous for being ashamed. The truth is that I am. And if anyone's listening, I'm sure you have people listening who have struggled with health issues or are, it's just effing embarrassing to have a health issue. It just mm -hmm. is. It's horrible to be different from other people. It's horrible to feel different. It's horrible to have 1,500 people in your family and elsewhere ask you what's wrong. Have you tried this? Oh my God. You know, <laughs> you and I have been through this and I know how that is. So I didn't want to go through that. So I just didn't talk about it. But in the not talking about it, I had this secret in the background lingering there that was screwing up my relationships. And it wasn't till I, I think that was your thyroid too. That suppression. Pro for sure. Pro Probably, you know, yeah. I think, I think uh, a lot of it was. Um, and so it, it's funny because, so what happened was, is make a long story short, although the details are in the book, yeah. I talked to my life coach who I've had for many years and he, I said, well, you know, 
I had a breakup five years ago. I thought I was going to marry the guy. The only thing that was wrong in the relationship, he was kind of an emotional robot. He wasn't very verbally expressive, although he was showed me in every way, but I, I, I'm the kind of person that needs words. And when I got out of that relationship, I called my coach crying and I was like, oh my God, this seems like a cruel joke. You know, this perfect guy for me. And, and, and then all of a sudden he's a robot and he goes, you know what? You're the robot. Did you tell him about your disability? And I was like, oh shit. And then he was like, uh, you're the one that needs to be vulnerable. How did you expect that you're going to run into someone that was emotionally available when you are not emotionally available? I have not cried harder in my life. It was the hardest katana sword right through the chest. So on point that he mm -hmm. said this. And so I said, well, what do I do? He's like, you're going to have to go about your life and you're going to start to have to try to be more vulnerable. And I was like, ah, well, like, how the fuck do I do that? You know, like I was so resistant. I was like, I don't want to do it. And he was like, he was like, well, you know, I can start at the grocery store, just having a conversation with people. And here's the funny thing. I can have the most intimate conversation this about someone's <laughs> health life or sex life in the steam room at my gym, yet somehow, you know, I have issues connecting, right? And so, um, <clears throat> so I did. I, I did some work on that. And finally, hold on, something's happening with the microphone. Yeah, it just, it everything's just cut good. out. Okay, yeah, everything's fine. Okay, great. Uh, so what happened was, is, and then I tested it out. You were the first person... I tested it out with. This was so funny. Like, I can't wait for people to read this part. A, yeah. you made me cry. Not just because I'm in the story. Just you were so open in your story of where you came from and how it all happened. And I'm not going to give it the details because right. I want everyone to read the story. But your story was heart-wrenching to me. I was just like, wow, that like to go from where you were, the, the position you were in, the power position you were in, to this journey of getting to that moment when, like you just said, you decided to be more vulnerable. And here comes Karen, our first conversation on the phone. And I say to hell, like, I can't remember the exact words, but it was like, you said you do so many things. Yeah. You know, your, your podcast, you do this, you go, what's your main source of income? Yeah. And that one was a killer to me who had been semantically dancing around this answer for a very long time when people would ask me this. And so I, in that moment was like, I'm just going to tell her the story. And I told you a cliff notes version of the entire story and admitted that I received most of my money from the, dis the private insurance I had for long-term disability with my company at the time. Cause I was, um, and your first response was, oh my God, L, that's why I do what I do because my hands were injured being a body worker for 15 years. And I lost my shit when I got off the phone. Yeah, I had no idea. I was just like, oh yeah, me too. Like how crazy, right? <laughs> and, you, and you had no idea that this no was like such a big moment. No, you didn't know each you other You told me after, well. you're like, Karen, I got off the phone and bawled my eyes out when you said that to me. Like what? Yeah, it was, yeah. it was crazy. But you know what it was? The reason I think I bawled my eyes out so much is here I had spent... Oh, a couple decades being ashamed and hiding this and only allowing the, the few people that knew about it, you know, I don't tell anybody. And so to get the response that I got from you was an immediate confirmation from the universe. Yeah. If there's not any more immediate confirmation that it's like, you see, and in that moment, I felt so much less alone to be talking to another woman, my age who had her hands ruined. Yes. You know, and it makes me want to cry now. And then I had, there's another story about Jeslyn who I had on the show and similar thing within a couple of weeks after talking to you, had a woman on the show, didn't know her health story. She revealed on the show that, um, her, she had a freak accident that led to nearly severing all of the nerves that led to her, her left hand and she can't feel her hand, but you can't see it. So we have the same, same thing. And again, so two women within a couple of weeks of me opening up and going forward in vulnerability about my situation, that happens. And I got two hand disability women. Like, what are the odds? What like, are, are the these chances? Chances? I've never met anyone with a hand disability. And then, you know, next thing you know. So that just made, you know, it like warmed my heart. And, and it's a story, like you said, you know, people have to read in the book because it's, it's mm -hmm. it takes you from the beginning to the end. But um, I knew at that point that I couldn't stop. And so then what happened was, is, um, I used to like wait, of course, like, I'm like, well, I'll date a guy for a while. If I think it's going there, if I think we're going to be in love, then I'll, then I'll be safe enough to tell my vulnerability story and my shame. And, um, I started to be like, all right, you know what? I got to have no shame about my shame. I'm just going to, I'm going to, just going to do it. So after you and Jeslyn, I, you know, would like go on a first date and I would just, people would ask me like, and I would just kind of tell the story. 
Nobody even like blinked an eyelash no. at it. <laughs> Nobody, you know, all these years I was so afraid someone's was going to reject me for it or look at me weird. And like, nobody even, they were just like, oh, oh yeah, it's awesome. Like nobody cared. And so all I got to say is <laughs> you got to get to it as soon as possible. Please don't waste decades and potential missed Health friendships issues. and opportunities. And, yeah. Look, there were, there, there were groups of people I chose to be on the outskirts of because I didn't want anyone to get too close to me because I didn't want to have to tell anybody. I really regret that. No woulda, coulda, shouldas, but you know what? I regret that. There, there, there were groups of people I could have made some, a tight tribe with that I didn't mm -hmm. because of this. Now, some people I called afterwards and I said, hey, look, you know, you've been so open about sharing your life with me. I want to share mine with yours. Um, so that was mine. And that was the, the little last puzzle piece that I had to get in order to become confident as fuck, meaning totally yeah. inside and outside, because I already was in every other way, Except but that. man, something like that, you don't think it's going to affect your life and it will. I love the story that you tell about Brandon, because that one yeah, really resonated with me in my own confident journey. <clears throat> you say that you point out how a belief instilled upon you in childhood can play out over and over again in your life until you learn from it. Talk to me about that because that I, I live by that. It's like, if you don't get the message or if you've got this limiting belief that is stopping you from doing things, it, that it does, it plays out over and over again in your life. Yeah. Brandon's a perfect one. So Brandon grew up where it was kind of one of those things like actually a really lovely family. Everyone had money and things. No one was, went starving, but his dad was kind of a hot jerk a little bit. And so let's say the hammer would go missing and you know, he'd get blamed for it. Like his dad would be screaming, where'd you put the hammer? I know you took it. And you know, Brandon would be like, I didn't do it. I didn't take it. I don't know where it is. I don't know where it is. And so he'd get blamed for being, you know, stealing the hammer. Then the dad would find the hammer and never apologize. So this mm -hmm. went over and over. It was always sort of made to be wrong, right? Made out to be wrong about stuff that he actually wasn't wrong about. So this then cut to his professional life as an adult. He's a contractor, so he's working on various projects. He starts getting complete, like everything always goes wrong. So this first contract with this one um, lead manager, everything would go wrong. It wouldn't be his fault, but then he'd get blamed for it and chastised and patronized publicly in front of everyone, which is horribly embarrassing, right? And because Brandon didn't speak up, he just sucked it up and just said nothing. So over time, we finally unraveled this and I was like, why does this keep happening to you? Because this has never happened to me on a job, right? Same thing with like friends and relationships. You know, it's like you go, oh, well, that's interesting. I, this stuff's happening over here in my relationships. I'm the common denominator. No one else I know is going through this. Yeah. Maybe it's my, maybe it's me. And so I was like, well, why you, Brandon? Like, you're not dumb. You don't make mistakes. You're not an idiot. Like it never happens to me. It's not that I'm a better worker than you. Why is this happening? So we dug back, we found this and I was like, oh my God. So part of it was really convincing Brandon that he didn't have to be wrong, you know, just, he didn't have to be wrong. Not only that though, it was also kind of getting him to a point where he was getting and mustering up the courage that the next time that a-hole on the job blamed him for something being wrong and patronized him, he was going to stand up and say something to effect of, Hey, unless you talk to me in an appropriate tone, I'm walking out of this job right now. Something like that. Now, don't do that unless you're prepared to lose the money and lose the job. But Brandon was, he had prepared himself. He was like, that's it. I've had enough of it with this guy. I'm getting good money from this project, but I'm not going to do this again. Well, here's what happened. He spoke up and did finally go, Hey, enough of that. It's so classic. Every time you actually stand up to a bully, they shut the F up and acquiesce almost always, but you don't know until you do it. When you put someone in your place like that, they're often like, Oh my God, because no one ever does it. So he does that to the boss. I was like, oh my God, boss never treated him like that again, but even better, he went to other contracts, stopped working with that guy. And then what happened is on every other contract, people would like write him afterwards and be like, oh my God, so smooth. What a great project. Thank you so much. You're awesome. We loved working with you. Like the opposite. He'd get all the praise. He, nothing went wrong. Now, here's what happens. You'll master something like that. You'll get over it. And then the universe is going to throw you a couple of testers. 
to see yeah. if you really got that damn lesson. And so Brandon did get a tester job that came in where mm, somebody was, and he had to just kind of speak up. But then Brandon would call me and be like, you'd be so proud of me. I, you know, I spoke up. And so again, now Brandon's life is great because all of the contracts he works on, and this has been years now, are with wonderful people that think like he does and treats people the way he does. And that old boss that was crappy just never seen again. And even if that old boss called and said, hey, would you work for me again? Brandon's at the point where he's like, I don't even want to bother with risking whether this guy's going to blow up or not. So I'm just not even going to work with this guy anymore. You know what I mean? But we have these stories. It could be a story about your childhood. You're the brat. You know, you're the one that always does stuff wrong or whatever it is. And this just was so clear because mm -hmm. it's not happening anymore for Brandon. So what changed? Okay. A little mustering up some confidence and courage to go stand up for himself. But it really was just going, why the fuck am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm only wrong because I'm repeating a pattern that's familiar to me. It's not healthy. It's familiar. That's psychology 101. That's why the girl goes out and gets the boyfriend who beats her because the father beat the... It's not healthy. We do it. So we have to look at... So what happened? And again, it's not like you have to dig too deep into the childhood, but what was your story within your family and with your members? And is there something they're relating to a conundrum going on in your adult life? Yes. You yeah. know, and, and so for me, my story, and I talk about this, the parental garbage in my life is, uh, my dad like lost all of our money when I was really young and was a total drunken loser. Now, super hilarious. Like all my friends wanted to hang out with my dad. He was super cool. It was like having a buddy around, right? Like he's cool if we drink, like whatever, but that's not what you really want in a dad. Okay. Like, you know what I mean? So it was embarrassing. Um, there were just lots of embarrassing moments having a drunk dad. I was just like embarrassed of my dad and, you know, and I, and I loved my dad, but like, it was just embarrassing. And so I had this story that I declared the universe. And I was like, here's the thing. You can't trust guys because see, they can have all this money, a perfect family, look great, tell you they'll take care of you. You stay home and have the kids. Then you're left in the dust broke with nothing. Like my mother who had to go pick up, you know what I mean? So I had this story what do you think showed up in my life? Guys that were unreliable or weren't into it or cheated or just were unambitious or were drunken loser. Everything showed up to confirm my young teenage declaration of can't trust men. Cause you know, yeah. that's what I saw happen to my mom. You know, back in those days, our parents, it was like the mom did stay home to raise the kids. It was a normal thing. And you know, uh, everything looked rosy and pretty with this family. And then it all fell apart. My mom got left in the dust. And I thought it was quite cruel to have my watch my mom struggle to put her two children through college and school with no help from my dad. So for me, I just, again, I declared that. So then I had to go back and kind of do a little ceremony like, all right, like to take that back, please. So I need to take that declaration back. <laughs> um, and what I realized too is that, again, I was the common denominator. My other girlfriends were not having these issues they weren't having them uh, it was just me and actually even my cousin who by the way is like even more she might her book would be called like brutal as fuck because she was <laughs> she my cousin is one of these people who walk up to you and go hey fatty let's go surfing you're getting chubby let's go i mean she didn't yeah, yeah. mess around right <laughs> and she said to me i was uh, visiting her in hawaii and she said i was going through one of these relationship things and she goes what's up, man? This doesn't happen to me or like any other girlfriends I've known, like my whole, and I just sat there. I was like, basically like, oh, it's just, oh, it's me. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what you could, if, he, if you guys could just listen to her words here, listen to what she says in this book, it could stop you from having a lifetime of agony and misery and your self pity party. Like when I got what she's talking about and mine was uh, kitchen, you know, on the kitchen floor. I just ended another relationship and like thinking to myself for the millionth time, nothing works. No man likes women that are independent. This is what my mom taught me, like, and feeling sorry for myself. And I had repeated the pattern over and over and over again. And then it was, you know, bottom of the barrel, it's lying there on my, my floor with my one year old. And I said to myself, if I don't, stop this. This is me. This is something to do with me and what I am attracting in my life. And if I don't stop, my daughter's going to follow in my footsteps. And I knew it in that instance. And I was like, it's me. I have to change. It's not the world around me. It's not every man that's out there. This is me. And if 
you are having this repetitive and don't you just see it now all the time, Alan, people where they'll tell you their story, right? Or this always happens to me, that those words, then it's like, well, wait a second then, what lesson are you not learning that life is trying to teach you? Yeah. It, and, and it won't, and you're exactly right. It's going to keep coming up and it kept coming, coming up until yeah. I figured and it out. worse and worse. And then when I figured it out, I attracted the opposite. And what was great is that all of my male friends, I had noticed that all of my guy friends were top notch, the best dad, yeah. the loyal guy, like all the things that I wanted in a guy. So I was clearly attracting and picking my male friends correctly, but I was not using the same discernment or vibes. <laughs> you know, so here I had all these wonderful men around me. I'm like, why am I attracting all the opposite of what I know is like, wonderful here, you know? And so again, it, you know, it just took some work. It took some work in me digging back into the past, uh, reading a couple of books, right? Doing some exercises, talking to a coach, and then finally really attracting a different vibration. And, and, and again, I had a tester I actually called you about that tester. Um, I did have a tester though, kind of come in, um, which will happen. You know what I mean? You yes. get a good string and then I got a tester. Thank God that tester only lasted a couple of months uh, versus like two years, you know, but it was quickly like, oh yeah, no, this is kind of the old energy. And I, I got really freaked out by that tester because, you know, you have a moment of like, I thought I was already beyond this, yeah. but again, it's just more room for deeper growth. growth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I had testers too, a hundred percent where it was like, Oh, but I've done all this work on myself. Why have I attracted yet another guy that's leaving me? Oh my God. And looking back, I knew then he wasn't the guy for me. He was just a really nice guy. So I'd attracted the really nice guy, but there wasn't a connection. And I was like, but why isn't it working? Why is he leaving me? You know, and then I met my husband. So there we go. Or came back together with my husband. <laughs> and yeah. now like, and that's been the longest relationship I've ever been in. You know, looking back, I can't tell you how many failed relationships I had. So yes, lesson learned, everybody. Now, one of my favorite chapters in, in the book that I was like, I had to, I had texted you about it because I was laughing so hard, is the downer effects chapter. <laughs> this one, I feel like should just be like in school curriculum. You must learn these rules, everybody. Like that's, they're so clear and they're so, I mean, I, I was ticking off like, oh, I got that one still. Oh, I still do that. Darn. But these are things that across the board, everybody's going to have done or is still doing sometime in their life. These are the downer effects. Um, don't judge. If you do, turn it around to yourself. So let's talk about that one. <laughs> I love that lesson, don't judge, because we all judge, man. It's horrible how much people judge. Yeah, I think it's, um, hmm, judge is one thing, because we can you can walk down the street and see someone's outfit and go, I think that's an ugly, that's the ugliest blouse I've ever seen. And, th and there's nothing like that's a judgment, but it's not, you know, it's kind of superficial. Right. Um, now if you were to walk by the person go, Oh my God, she's so stupid for wearing that. Oh, it's a whole different level of judgment. So, you know, you can have observational judgments. We all make that we have taste and preferences, but what this is about is really when you roll your eyes at someone and you're like, yeah, right. Good luck with that. It's the kind of judgment on someone else's life and what they're doing. Um, and usually we know we're doing it because it doesn't feel good inside. You know when you're judging and in someone else's business. And it usually will backfire on you. And so when it comes to confidence, um, I had... <laughs> I mean, the, one of the funniest ones is back in high school, there were two girls I used to go to high school with and they were sitting around talking about how they were going to go to LA and pursue their Hollywood um, acting dreams. And I was the total towner. And inside I was going, <clears throat> yeah, right. Good luck with that. They'll be flying back home in no time. Yeah, whatever, ladies. Hmm. Yeah, nice try. Oh my God, they both became famous, incredibly like revered actors, actresses to this day, you guys. Okay. So, so in my face, because then 15 years later, my hands get injured. I can only use my voice. I go into acting and voiceover. And then what do I get? The same kind of downer from other people. You tell them you're an actor and they're like, good luck with that. Or you see the rolled eyes for a friend, yeah. like good luck with that. Anytime you're actually saying good luck with that. And you have that kind of vibe about someone you're wishing upon, you're wishing their failure upon them. That's what yeah. you're wishing. Yeah. So let's, let's really talk about that. You are wishing them to fail. You're hoping that they fail. Stop it. You got to be down with other people's confidence or yours is going to get effed with. 
And one of the things is, you know, you know this about me, I'm an extreme cheerleader. I do not compete with other people. I'm a total pro woman woman. If you called me and said, I want to write a book, I wouldn't feel threatened. I'd teach you how to write one. Um, because I, I don't believe in competing with other people. I don't, I don't get into that jealousy junk. Um, and, and that's why we, you and I only want to hang out with those kind of women. You know, we don't want to hang out with these catty bitches out there. If you have a feeling that your friends are out there and they're kind of not supportive of you and you know this, they probably aren't. Get rid of them. Get rid of the good luck with that. Yeah, right. They are not in your favor. They're, they're, they're hoping for your failure. Now there's lots of levels of downers and I go through like a bunch of different yeah, scenarios yeah. of one, they're but funny. I want to talk about one that, um, I was like a horrific downer. Um, my friend who's our age never has had health insurance. Now I'm a beneficiary of health insurance. So I believe it's important. I was raised, you don't walk out of the house without health insurance. Cause you know, you get hit by a bus. You don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of reasons why people buy health insurance. So I am just like a health insurance person. Right. And my friend has not had health insurance her whole life. And I remember being like, what? And I, I had this conversation with her. I'm like, you're insane. What are you thinking? I mean, I did everything I could to convince her that she was insane for not having health insurance and she needed to get it. And she said, El, I just don't have this belief about health in myself. I don't worry about it. I have totally different levels of a different belief system than you do. I just don't believe what you do about it. I feel totally fine about my health. Now, that's totally valid. But in that moment, I was like, oh my God, that's insane. I get off the phone with her. My first thought is, you know what? Watch, something's gonna happen. She'll see I'm right. But we need to look at that. Yeah, a lot of people have that thought. Think about that. We have to break it down. In order for me to be right, my friend has to be not only completely screwed medically in some way, some tragedy has to happen, but whatever happens has to be so effing expensive that she's so screwed that she regrets not having health insurance. Would have to be a lot of money. Do I really want that to happen to my friend? Oh my God, what an asshole am I? Who do I think I am? What was I thinking? What bad energy out there? And so I actually called her and I was like, oh my God, I can't even believe like I'm such a downer. But the thing is, is that we all have thoughts like that. It's just ego popping up for a moment because you think you're right. But whenever you think you're right, it usually corresponds with someone else's failure. When you are sitting there going, oh, watch, you'll see, I'm right. What that usually means, if we look at the scenario, like I just told you, you are hoping someone fails. So you need to stop it. Now, we're still going to have these thoughts. They come up. It's ego. The key is catching them right away and go, hold on a minute. I cancel. I do not want to put out that vibe about my friend. No, I don't want her to get hurt. In fact, my God, I hope now and never, she never does because she doesn't have health insurance. So I definitely don't want her to never get hurt. She would have to be totally screwed for me to be right. So again, when we're, when we're thinking we're like, yeah, right. Good luck with that. Or we're like, hmm, you'll see, I'm right. Those are usually things you're being a downer and people go, well, why does it matter? It will seep in your subconscious, it's low vibration. It will matter, it'll come back back around. Don't do it. When it comes up, turn the vibration around. Yeah. Another downer uh, that's palatable that way is an example I put in there where someone's assistant quit at a bad time. They, they, you know, they, they were busy. And the assistant quit because they got a job that was a promotion for them to be the exact same position you know, as, as, their, as their boss, who they were leaving. And so her name's Candace and she called me and she's like, I can't believe he's leaving. You know, He got this other job, he's gonna have my position. He only knows how to manage a small group of people. He's not gonna figure it out, watch. He's gonna like totally screw up, not gonna be able to handle it. He'll be coming crawling back for his jobs on his hands and knees. And I said, whoa, girl, you really want that to happen to that dude? That means he's got to be so embarrassed and mortified, did such a horrible job that he's crawling back and begging you. I go, do you really? I go, you like this guy. You don't even want him to quit. Now you want him to fail in life and be embarrassed? And she's like, oh my God, I don't know. I go, and I know, but that's why we're breaking it down because that's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. And so we go through it. She's like, no, actually, he's a lovely guy. I actually really do want him to be successful. And I said, well, what if he goes into that job and the person that was in the position before was so awful that they kick ass? Or what if they just go in and, and dominate? And, and I mean, why not put that out there. And she was like, no, 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 you're right. I, I feel like a jerk. All right. Now, why is that important that we got her out of that energy? Because the next day she's going to walk back into work for the remaining two weeks that guy is there. You don't think that energy is going to be palpable of like, yeah, right. Good luck with that new job that you can't handle, dude. That's going to come out. We all know when people have better energy to yes. us. Don't say you don't, you know it. So what a better, nice, supporting, encouraging, cheerleading situation. Does she walk in because she got that yuckiness out of there and now she's walking into work. Turns out, by the way, that guy killed it. 
a year later, I asked Candace about the guy. She goes, you know what? Oh my God, he's just, he's just, he's killing it. Everyone loves him. He's doing an amazing job. Awesome. You know? Yeah. So, but again, like it was just an ego thought. It was just her ego being mad and being like, he's leaving me at a time I'm busy. And, and then going into again, judging, like he's not going to be able to fit. By the way, most of the time when you project some shit like that onto someone, you will be wrong. They yeah. will prevail. They, yeah. they, they, they will actually. So in the course of you thinking you're voodooing someone else and getting in the bad luck, it's actually, it's going to backfire. They're going to succeed. Yeah. And, and that's what I say on the other hand too. When anyone's a negative naysayer towards me, I'm like, bring it. You're increasing my success because any negative BS that comes my way, I interpret it and I go, it's, it's just, it's going to happen. It just, it's, it, it, it fuels me in a way. I almost take it as like, oh, that's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> because Which I most know- people wouldn't do that. Most people would be like, oh, okay, well, I better not do that then if you don't believe in me. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I had one. So uh, I want to talk about one flippant comment is a, uh, um, when you are in a creative pos- pr- profession, which I am like writing, speaking, acting, any of that stuff, you get more shit from the rest of the world than anyone else does. And so I would tell someone like, Oh, I'm a writer. And they would, I literally had a guy who said this to me, he goes, yeah. So are you like a real writer who makes money at it? Or are you like write at Starbucks on your free time, but you like really wait tables. And I said, uh, wow, dude, that's a downer. Uh, would you ask that to a real estate agent? Would you say, do you just have your license or do you actually sell houses and make money at it? Or do you like live at home and, you know, work at Starbucks? He goes, well, no, I mean, that's different. I go, no, it's not. It's not different. It's rude. But thankfully my belief is that everybody like you, who's a negative Nancy and comes at me like that, you just launched me to success. So thanks a lot downer, you know, and that was the end of that conversation. Um, again, you know, you're going to be challenged, especially if you're in a creative profession or an entrepreneurial yeah. profession. Yeah. And so what are you going to do? Cause the world is going to show you statistics. People mm-hmm. are going to come up and be like, really a new business? Well, 50% oh, of them fail yeah. at more like 90%. I think I was told. Yeah. Well, okay. So how about I be part of the 10% that succeed? F yeah. you. You know what yeah. I mean? Oh, yeah. it must be really tough being a writer. Really not for all the people making money doing it. I don't know. I mean, what, what, what? so, so, one of the things I ran, there's no one ever built a statue to a skeptic. There's no statue out there in any park, national monument of a guy. And then the, the, the little caption <laughs> on the plate, the little caption says, this guy challenged everything, didn't believe in anything, never thought anything was possible. Total skeptic. We, we don't look up to these people. No, we, we don't. We look up to the people that are like, oh, really? You don't think it can be done? Watch. Yeah. That's yeah. who That's who we build statues to. Yeah. So again, um, you're going to come across this and you might come across it in your own family. Like I talked a lot about how I've been downered by even people that love you that aren't normally downers. Oh, it happens all the time. Family, I think is the worst. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. I, so just to backtrack here, cause I have to tell this story cause it was after I read your book and literally like three days later, I'm driving down the hill to town and I live up in the mountains. And so I have to go down this really sketchy, windy road. And in the winter, I honestly see a car like every other day in the ditch over the cliff upside down. Like it's, it's a dangerous little road in the winter. And so I'm going like, it's like freshly snowed. The plow hasn't been up and I'm going 40 down the hill. Usually I'm a bit of a speed driver. So, you know, I'm, I'm really going slow. And this guy comes up behind me on a double, like on a yellow line, um, like blind corner and zips past me and, and, and basically like you could, you could see that, you know, there's nobody coming, like it wasn't horrible, but he still, he passed me. He could have been hit by another oncoming truck car. And my first thought was, oh, well, I'll I'll bet I'll see you in the ditch. Won't I? When I get down the hill, (laughs) (laughs) like instantly bad thought. And I'm like, Oh, and then your voice came into my head and I'm like, so really what I'm wishing upon this person is that he's in a car accident. Like, so then I can be like, ha, you, yeah, and that's the last time you passed me, you know? Horrible. Literally, because he's Horrible. passed on. That's why he yes. can't pass like, you anymore. <laughs> no, but these are the, I'm glad you brought that up. I, look, we still have these thoughts. I talk about yes. how I have like a total prejudice against, you know, road cyclists. <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. I see a road cyclist and I'm like, oh my God, you jerk. Get off, get off no. the road. But what's yeah. funny is like that throws us off of our vibration and, and that story is funny in itself. But yours is a perfect example because we do this all the time. You know, uh, again, the thought comes up like, yeah, right, good luck. Or watch, they'll see just catch yourself. Because in that moment, like you said, you caught yourself and you're like, all right, hold on a minute, you know, F that guy. But like, do I really want to see his car? So I can have a one, because I guarantee you, you would see his car in the ditch the next day and you wouldn't be like, ha ha. You'd be like, no. oh God, oh my yikes. Gosh, no. And then you might yeah. feel like, 
jinxy about it. You might be like, mm. I just was talking about this guy in a ditch and now his car's there. It would not feel as good as you think it does in that moment. Um, it, that still doesn't mean that there's not moments where you have a flippant, uh, I'm also about indulging your ego. Sometimes you need to be like, you just need to feel that way because it makes you feel better in that moment. It might be a false sense, but I'm okay with that because again, I, I feel like uh, we are in this meat suit and I'm tired of spiritual teachers and self-help people being like, the goal is that you get to a platform where you're not, you know, affected by anything that comes your way and you can stay in a state of peace. I'm not living on a hippie commune, biatch. I'm living in the real world. People are going to come at you. What yeah. you're going to do? And also too, I don't believe that would be the most spiritual for me when it's rare, but I still occasionally will get tested on speaking up. Extremely rare. But three times in the past five years, I've been bullied by random strangers. <laughs> and they regret it every time. Like, horrifically regret it. They're like, I messed with the wrong chick. It's a regret anytime someone tries to do this. But I am really brutal. And the thing is, is that some people might be like, well, wouldn't it be more spiritual to just have let it go? I'm like, no, actually, it wouldn't be. Not for me. Because guess what? I'm I still have to fuel that primal instinctual part of me to survive, to draw boundaries, to go, hey, you're not coming into this camp, right? Or to survive. And I don't think it's so bad. I think when ego gets out of control, yeah, it's terrible. But sometimes things need to be said in a harsh tone. Sometimes you need to call some people on some stuff. Sometimes you need to put someone in their place. And I'm all about that. Does not mean I don't go looking for fights and you got to choose your battles wisely. That's another confident as F tenant as well. But again, I'm, I'm not all about, oh, just sit there and accept. I feel it's good for us to stand up for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's good for us to speak up. We see what happens with thyroid problems and other things when you don't. So then that person who's not speaking up, are they just going, well, I just think it's the more spiritual, it's better, I'm more evolved. No, you're not. It's eating away at you that you didn't say that to that guy and you didn't speak up to them after they yelled in your face. I know it is because I talk to a ton of people who don't speak up and they are regretting those moments. I, on the other hand, when I got bullied by three women in the past five years, all of them at my gym. <laughs> this is great. Oh. And, um, and here's the funny thing about it. Each one of them, when I think back on it, I'm like, oh, uh, it, 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 like, it's a gift that keeps on giving. I'm not kidding. My exchanges with them, while contentious and harsh as F, fuel me to this day because wow. I stood up for myself and I didn't let someone patronize me. And by the way, they can't even look at me. They're so afraid at this point. And you know what? Good. That'll teach you not to come up and bully a stranger. You don't know who you think's a short blonde, whatever. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, now it rarely happens to me because I do, I put, I, I have a vibe about me. That's kind of like, you know, don't, people don't usually mess with me that way. However, it's always a stranger. And when it happens, um, Again, I'm, 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 it, God, it's, it feels yucky in the moment. You're, you're in a, your blood pressure's up. You're in a contentious situation with someone, but the aftermath feels so great because it's like, I didn't take that shit. I am not going to, you are not going to talk to me like that. You know what I mean? And that feels so much better than just blowing it off because I guarantee you go home and you're like, oh, I should have said that. Or I wish I could. No, I'm more confident because I did have those interactions. Even yeah. more confident. Yeah, it's a real, uh, that's it's a, a fine, fine line. line. It's a fine line. And I feel like I need more of what you're talking about. I, like I'm super confident in so many ways, but I d definitely don't speak my mind enough because I worry about what other people will think of me. I do have that lack of confidence in that or, or careful of what I say. I don't want to offend somebody. And then, you know, I need to learn sometimes you do like sometimes you, you have the right to speak up for yourself i think that that's what it is is you have to kind of try to distinguish those moments of do can i just let this go it's their shit or do i need to defend myself and speak up yeah. for myself yeah it's tough. and for me it was like i'm gonna see these uh women at the gym every day they're not winning this one you are not yeah. gonna win this one the chick in the parking lot who yells at me whatever i'll let that go i'm not gonna see you i don't care but the woman in my locker room who's starting some shit with me in the sauna oh forget about it you are gonna get your ass handed to you no i'm serious and you know one of the things that they regret is that so i'm not only a fast talker i'm extremely articulate i have years of improv experience behind me and a very foul mouth when needed you're gonna get murdered with work like don't, you know what I mean? And also too, it's a lesson. I, I guarantee you those chicks are like, 
going to refrain when they speak to a stranger from now on. Sometimes there's a part of me that thinks that, because I am so anti-adult bullying. And, and so I feel like it's kind of is a little bit of my job to like bully back bullies. You know, if I'm getting bullied, you're going to, you're going to get, you're going to get it back even worse and then regret you started in the first place. Now you're, the last time this happened to me was a couple months ago in the steam room. Some chick started shit out of nowhere with me. I, I went off on a just murderer with words. She was so stunned and sidelined. She couldn't even speak. And it was beautiful. I was like, yeah, that's it. That's, that's exactly what should happen. That, how, how, did, how did that work out for you? How did that work out for you? I was having a nice time over here in the steam room. You just came out. I don't even know you. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, but you know, it won't happen again. She won't do it again. I mean, and this happens, like there was one woman at my uh, gym who, again, I don't know what has happened. She's in the sauna and like, I guess she was moving around and, you know, getting her stuff out. And some woman just goes, you're making too much noise. I mean, like just people like that coming at you. You know, and my friend in the steam room looked at her and said, you know, if you want quiet, you can go buy your own sauna for your own house. Or, you know, said something like that to her. But it's stuff like that. Like, if you're going to come at me out of nowhere and you don't know me, I'm probably going to teach you a lesson and you probably won't do it again. Um, but it's more less about teaching someone a lesson because I don't care if they learn it. It's the fact that uh, I did not allow you to do that to me. I did not allow you. are not going to patronize me. You are not going to power over me. You are not going to barrel over me. Um, now, and most of the time when you do this, again, they acquiesce, they shut up, they don't know what to do. And they just, they're stunned because again, they weren't expecting it. Well, then don't dish it out. Um, I don't do it. I don't bully people. Um, when I was a kid, I might've been kind of a, a shithead, but I, I, I really don't like it. Um, when I say that, and you know, I think a lot of people are being kind of bullied by their friends and we, you know, talking about this book, one of the downer effects, you got to rid of, got rid of toxic people. You got to get rid of these people that aren't in your favor. If you don't feel like when you call your friend and you're excited about something or an idea you have, and you feel like they're either jealous or, or they're not really supportive or they don't believe in you. F that friend, get new ones, get another coach. Uh, Steve Harvey quote comes to mind. Don't tell your million dollar dreams to hundred dollar people. Yeah. You know, and so I learned that too harshly. We want the people that we love when we call them to have the enthusiasm and excitement. Of, and they sometimes are just downers. Yeah. No. So well, there's people them. I won't call, like my mom, <laughs> unfortunately. Sure. Because she's always got, she's always the devil's advocate. She's always got something to say that's not great. And I unfortunately think that I have a bit of that trait where I, I, uh, I'll be realistic about something, somebody's situation, and I'll tell them like, well, have you really thought this through? Have you thought about this, this, or this? And so I've actually made a conscious effort to be more supportive now and just be like, okay, no, put your shit aside, Karen. Don't worry about it. Let them figure it out on their own. Who knows what's going to happen? Right. And here's the thing. Unless it's something short of like dangerous, like, oh my God, do not take yeah. that drug or like, do not do that. Um, what is the harm in that? Yeah. So what if they do fail? Yeah. It's Okay you might silently be like, well, I kind of saw that coming. That's yeah. okay. You don't have to voice it. You might think it, but at the end of the day, don't voice it. But at the end of the day, it's like, so what? But they yeah. did it. Encourage them anyway. Let them fail. Yeah. Um, because what they'll remember is that you encouraged them yes. and you weren't the downer. Yeah. You know, again, statistics, so skeptics. And this happened with my book. And I talk about this with a family mm -hmm. member. Uh, the first was my first book. I said to them, oh, uh, I'm so excited. I'm going to pitch a book to Mark Sisson. And they said, well, you've never written a book before. Just like that. And I said, well, that's just semantics at this point. I mean, I've, I've written a million things. It's just another genre. I'm not worried about it. Second stage, Mark says, I'm going to publish your book. Talk to the family member. Oh my God, Mark's going to publish my book. Here's the response. Well, now you have to write it. Oh my God. Oh my God. So right there, I'm like, Oh my God. And I was like, what? I was just like, Oh, it's almost laughable. Cause I was like, well, yeah, I'm going to effing write it. And also I write stuff. I'm a person that writes stuff. I've been a writer. It's not like I've never written anything in my life. Like, of course I'm going to write it. What do you think I'm going to take a deal from Mark and then fail? But like F you, right? Oh, it gets worse. Then I, I write the book. Then, then it, it, it's getting published and Barnes and Noble bookstores decides to buy a thousand copies of it before the book is actually even published, meaning they haven't read the book yet, but they're, they, they believe in it. They like it. They're going to buy it. And so I'm telling this to the family member and she's like, well, that's ridiculous. Why would Barnes and Noble buy a book they never even read yet? So again, like at every step of the way, I'm getting downer by someone who normally is in my corner, who loves me, who is a family member. Okay. And so they're maybe in this temporary state of disbelief about me, but at every step of the way, God 
Ooh, so you can either let that fuel your confidence or let that put you down. I let it fuel it again. Cause I was like, okay, downer, you just won retribution for that shit. That's coming right back to you. You're going to see how wrong you are. And again, it's really not about proving them wrong. It's about proving yourself awesome. That's one of my quotes from the book, but again, it's you, you, you show them wrong. So then later on, I pointed this all out to them. You know what I mean? But what they had done by those comments is really relegating me to a life where I had failed at every step of the way. Like couldn't finish the book for Mark, right? Or first of all, oh my God, you have to write and never written one. So how do you know how to do it? Oh, thanks for that. Then the second one is, well, now you have to actually write it. Don't think you're going to do it. You might fail at that. You might not complete. Okay. Then the next one is why would Barnes and Noble, they might fail. They might regret buying a book they haven't read. That was done. Oh my God. And every step of the way, I'm like a failure in this process. Later on, after I wrote the book, I showed that whole thread to them. And I said, this is you, buddy. And they were like, they saw how I interpret it that way. And they're like, well, that wasn't my intention. It sometimes isn't the intention, but it's in the words, like you're being a downer, you know, just be like, great. That's awesome. And then I had actually one of my best friends called me while I was writing the, the first book, The Paleothyroid Solution. And like a parent who was worried that their kid wouldn't finish the science project before school, they called me up and like, dude, what are you doing? Are you writing? How far are you? How's it going? Like very skeptical. And I called them on it and I said, hey man, just because you're not confident about writing a book, don't project that insecurity onto me, number one. Number two, you're being a downer. You're the last person I need to be coming in here over my head trying to check. Have I never finished something? I've, I always finish what I start. You know this, you've known me for 30 years. Dude, that's just, you, just because you can't imagine writing a book, don't project that onto me. And they were like, you're right, I'm sorry. You know, that's why it's good to have confidence as that friends because they can take and handle a mic drop like that from a friend. It's over. We've had like two of those in our lifetime. But again, you don't know where it's going to come from. It can come from your best friend who's supportive of you every day. You got to speak up at every turn. Um, and I do, you know what I mean? And they do as well. And I expect that in return. So yeah. I got downered by all sides on my first book. Now, were any of their fears true? They were opposite. It's a bestseller. It's a bestseller. Yeah. They're yeah. The You've opposite. changed they, millions of lives. Like they're wrong. <laughs> they, they were dead wrong at every yeah. step of the way and F them for being downers during my process. Turns out I wrote about it, showed it to them. That's you, Emma Fugga. How'd you like that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so now they know the language so that if I hear it, I'll go, dude, you're being a downer, you know, or I'll yeah. say to that family member, don't, don't downer me, you know, don't be a downer. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not sometimes a downer, that I don't have downer thoughts. I do. Like I said, it's natural part of, I think, ego. Yeah. It's just that I'll catch them and try to cancel them or try to kind of rethink through that, maybe even offer a supportive vibration. Um, but for the most part, I really am encouraging other people's success. And, and that's really where you have to be if you want to be confident and successful. Because if you're jealous, confident people aren't jealous. Mm -hmm. Just aren't. No, no I'm not. So at the time of this airing, we're nearing the end of 2019. So coming into 2020, what would life look like for all of you listeners if you held people up all the time, that you encouraged the people around you all the time, that you didn't take bullshit from anybody, even your loved ones, that you stood up for yourself, that you were confident, that you, that you could see the patterns that weren't serving you anymore in your life and you did something about them. Where would you be at the end of 2020 if you just did those things? And that is just a small portion, I might add, of Elle's new book. So rush out and buy it, <laughs> obviously. It's a great book to head into 2020 with because really, where would you be just doing those things that we just have talked about today? So I encourage you all to do that. Um, I know I'm going to work on some things. So thank you, Elle, for that. Thank you for the book. And thank you for your time for the fourth time. And you know what? You can come back as much as you want because you know I love you. <laughs> well, you as well. In 2020, you have to make another appearance on our show because yes, you've only had absolutely. one. So we got to yeah. get that yeah. number. Come on. Yeah. You've got like three more then to... <laughs> Sorry, well, Mark. We're going to have Karen on every month. <laughs> every Basically every week she's coming on. Um, you know, and I think you'll agree. It's a quick, easy, fun read. It's also a good book. It is. Have, it's a good book if you have like some downer friends or people in your family. Or, eh, mm, hey, maybe you just get them as out. a gift. Here's a yeah. gift. Yeah. Um, 
and then you don't have to tell them everything in it. But I just want to say, you know, the, the whole tenet about it is like to really encourage people to get into a self-examination space yeah. to improve their life. But what I know you, you know, Mark wrote it in his forward to my book, Mark Sisson, which is, this is about relatable stories. And I know you agree yeah. because when I read books and self-help books or any of this kind of stuff, and I love a lot of teachers out there, but sometimes I'm like, give me an example. Give me a real life tangible example, something like I can sink my teeth into. And that's really what I wanted to offer here was like yeah. real life examples you could be, you could relate to. It's worth it, everybody. It's so yeah. worth it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like I said, in my review of it, I just, I feel like there's no, there's no fluff, which a lot of self-help books have a lot of fluff in it that you got to work your way through. And it's all fun to be nice to read. And it sounds all pretty and sweet, but come on, let's just really tell, tell it like it is. And what I like is that you're calling people out on their shit. Like I was like, Oh damn it. I do that. God damn it. You know? And it made me really take a look at myself and I don't, I, I can't say that there's a lot of self-help books that, that have done that for me in the past. So I think it's great. So thank you so much. And I wish you all the luck with it. Of course.